welcome back to another edition of The American Nation with Mr. Hubner. Today we're looking at Chapter 6, Section 4, Fighting for Liberty on Many Fronts. And as you can see, we've already done an audio recording of this, but I like doing these video recordings of the lessons as well, so we're going to do that as another option for uh, how you can go about through the lesson. So let's look at our essential question for today. Now, during the Revolution, what were some of the different ways that Americans fought for liberty, and what were some of those different fronts? So, based on the essential question, we're going to be looking at different ways that Americans fought for liberty during the Revolutionary War, and we're also going to see some of the different fronts. We've been talking about the war in the North, and in the Middle States, and in the South. Now we're going to look at some of the different areas that people were fighting for liberty. So. So first things first, I want us to take a look at this, uh, take a look at this image, uh, and where does this quote come from? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are create, created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, who deserves life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Well, according to this quote, which comes to us from the Declaration of Independence, it makes the claim that these rights are above all laws and that they should be guaranteed to all men. But what about women? What about slaves? Do they fall under this category of all men? Well, as we look today at the impact that uh, women and African Americans had on the Re Revolutionary War, I want us to remember that in many people's eyes, women and African Americans especially were considered lower class citizens and even lower, a lower class of human. So if someone is willing to fight for freedom and liberty, then shouldn't that same person be entitled to that same freedom and liberty? that they are fighting for. Hmm. Some women taking part in the war. Now, women in the colonies found a lot of different ways to take part in the revolution alongside the men that were fighting. Uh, many joined their husbands actually out on the front lines and acted as nurses or cooks. And the picture we're looking at right now is of uh, Mary Ludwig Hayes, who was one such woman who uh, took part in the battles by serving water to the different uh, the different soldiers, and she got the nickname from that Molly Pitcher. Well, she's become famous in American history because at one point during a battle, her husband was wounded, and so she took over her husband's cannon duties when he was injured. Uh, another woman that has become synonymous with the American Revol Revolutionary War is Betsy Ross, who Betsy Ross sewed flags for Washington's army, and according to legend, she was the first to make the American flag consisting of the stars and stripes. So by taking on these new roles, caused many women to question the lack of rights that they currently had. Many had taken over th their husband's farms or businesses, the ones that were not able to go out and join their husbands on the front lines. So the husbands left, and many of them stayed, ho stayed home and took over the farms or took over their business to keep the family afloat. So by doing so, it helped to help their confidence to build. So if a woman can run a farm, then why can't she vote or have some other say in society? So these ideals of liberty and equality, um, we can see them being established and starting to grow a little bit during the revolution. Um, and these would later inspire women to fight for their own liberty and equality, but that's not going to come for many, many years. But our first video is actually going to talk about some of the roles that women played in the Revolutionary War. And then when we're done with that, we will pick right back up with some of the other groups that took part in the Revolutionary War. While men of all races and religions were fighting the British, the women of the colonies cooked, nursed, ran hospitals, sewed, raised supplies and money, and suffered many hardships for their cause. 
Many followed their husbands in the army, making life a little more comfortable by preparing meals for the soldiers. Other women spied on the enemy, carrying important information back to the revolutionary forces. Women melted their pewter into bullets and made their bedding into uniforms. But women did more than just support the men in their fight. Mrs. David Wright of Massachusetts was elected sergeant of a company of soldiers' wives who formed their own army unit after their husbands went off to battle. They captured enemy spies and brought information to the colonies. During many battles, women fired cannons and fought beside the men. A woman named Molly Corbin took her dying husband's place at a gun post during the defense of Fort Washington. So we discussed the roles, some of the roles that women had in the Revolutionary War, but what about uh, African Americans that were living in the colonies at this time? Now, they faced some very, very difficult choices. Uh, and at first, when the Continental Army was founded by the Con Continental Congress, uh, Congress would not allow any of the over 500,000 African Americans living in the colonies to serve in the army. So at first, no African Americans, free or slave, were allowed to join the army. And in response to this, the British started, started changing the policy for their own army and enlisting African Americans. So in, because of this, Washington asked Congress to allow free African Americans to enlist. So after Washington asks Congress to allow free African Americans to enlist, uh, between the Army and the Navy, about 7,000 African Americans ended up serving for the Continental Army. Now, some formed special regiments, like the one we're looking at, the, uh, the full uh, Rhode Island Regiment. Rhode Island was actually the first American state to raise an entire regiment of black soldiers. So this picture is of, um, of that regiment in, as was depicted in the ba battle near Newport, Rhode Island in 1778. So some formed their own special regiments while others served as drummers, spies, fifers, and guides in the other regiments. But this was free African Americans. Uh, slaves, on the other hand, faced an even, even tougher choice. Now, if they joined the Continental Army but were captured by the British, then there's a good chance they might be taken and sold back into slavery. But if they tried to flee the army for freedom, they might be hanged by angry patriots. So they really were had difficult decisions to make on on all sides. Now many slaves did now many slaves did free, flee their masters and actually ended up helping the British in order to try and gain their freedom. Uh, the image that we're looking at right here is actually a painting of, a, of British soldiers uh, talking to an African-American loyalist. Um, but there were black patriots who hoped that the war would help to bring an end uh, of slavery. That was due mainly in part to the wording of the Declaration of Independence. But by the 1770s, uh, slavery was really on the decline in the North, and some states even outlawed slavery. But again, this is in the North. So even at this time, slavery in the colonies, you can see there's a little bit of starting to be a, uh, a pull between it being uh, less and less in the North, but the South was still holding strong to their roots of slavery. But all of that to say, uh, the slaves that did enlist and did help the Patriots did so because they hoped that by winning the war against the British, eventually slavery would be completely done away with. But as we know, it was done away with, but it still took many, many, many years and another war. Throughout the revolution, as many as 5,000 black soldiers fought with the rebels, just as many fled to the British. Britain saw them as Tories who could be inspired to fight for Britain and for the Empire on one very simple condition, that they were offered their freedom and given that freedom in exchange for taking arms. The South was exactly the opposite. The slaveholders had very, very serious reservations about arming black people 
for fear they would turn their arms against their owners. The northerners felt that they must arm black people because they had too much to do uh, keeping the farm going to enlist, say, for long terms in the Continental troops. By 1778, one in 20 of Washington's soldiers was black. This was the last integrated American army until the Korean War. Now, what about the war out on the frontier? Now, as the war spread out west into Indian territory, both the Continental Army and the British tried to gain support of the various tribes living there. And of the two, the British were much more successful in gaining allies in the north and the south among tribes by convincing the Indians that if the colonists won, then they would spread out eventually into Indian territory and would continue to take their lands. And pictured here is Chief Joseph Brandt, who was one of the chiefs that joined the British side um, and conducted raids throughout Pennsylvania and New York on colonial settlements. But there were some tribes that did help the colonial army, and they were crucial to American victories in Ohio. But, and in the Southwest, another, another one of the fronts, uh, Americans were helped by New Spain. Uh, and at first, Spain had been neutral, but this man, uh, Bernardo de Galvez, who was the governor of Louisiana, was, had been secretly helping the Americans. And when Spain officially entered the war in 1779, he took a very active role and was responsible for American victories along the Mississippi River and actually helped to drive the British out of western Florida. So. Um, a military hero that doesn't get a lot of recognition when we talk about the American Revolution really is Bernardo de, Bernardo de Galvez, and he was very instrumental in the Western theater and in Florida. While the revolution raged up and down the Atlantic coast, another struggle was being fought at the heart of the continent for the future of the continent, the Western frontier. For years, American settlers had been pushing their way into Britain's vast lands beyond the Allegheny Mountains. In response, the British began inciting their Indian allies to attack them. On the whole, the uh, Native Americans, the Indian tribes, supported the British in the American Revolution because they believed that they stood a better chance of retaining their lands than if the notoriously land-hungry colonists controlled the frontier areas. In 1778, a plan to cut off the raids was proposed by a tough red-haired explorer from Virginia, Militia Colonel George Rogers Clark. He would attack the undermanned British forts in the Northwest, present-day Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, and Illinois. If he succeeded, he would also extend Virginia's boundaries to cover an area nearly the size of Europe. On the 26th of June, Clark and 175 frontiersmen shot the rapids of the Ohio River into enemy territory. The mission was made more ominous by a total eclipse of the sun. Clark assured the men it was a good omen. Pushing them around the clock, Clark got his men to the mouth of the Tennessee River in four days then led them overland to hack their way through 50 miles of forest. George Rogers Clark, is he a great tactician? Not terribly. Is he a great uh, planner? Not really. But he can get men to walk through swamps. He can get men to do incredible feats that they don't believe they can do themselves. On July 4th, only eight days after they set out, Clark and his men arrived near the British-held town of Kaskaskia in the Illinois country. 
Within 15 minutes, they surrounded the town's fort and took it without firing a shot. The French settlers were relieved to learn that France and America were now allies and that Clark hadn't come to kill them. 180 miles away, French settlers in the Indiana country happily greeted news of the alliance by turning over the prized fort at Vincennes to Clark's state of Virginia. To hold Vincennes, Clark sent three soldiers, all he could spare. Six months later, the fort was retaken by British Lieutenant Governor Henry Hamilton, called the hair buyer for his willingness to purchase rebel scalps. When Clark heard of the loss of Vincennes, he lamented, I would have bound myself for seven years a slave to have 500 troops. What he did have were 150 troops and few supplies. In the chill of February 1779, Clark began the long hazardous trek to take back Vincennes. In places, the country was flooded five miles across with chest-deep icy water. Rarely did the men wear dry clothes or sleep on dry ground. Not one deserted. Seventeen days after setting out, Clark's small band arrived a mile from the fort. To give the illusion of several columns, Clark divided his men and, as in the biblical Battle of Jericho, told them to make as much noise as they could. Colonel Hamilton assumed some drunken locals were firing off their guns until one of his men fell from a rifle shot. The next morning, Clark demanded that Hamilton surrender immediately and unconditionally. Hamilton refused. That afternoon, Clark forced Hamilton's hand. His men had just captured an Indian raiding party, including the young Ottawa chief, Makut Mong. Clark ordered the Indians tomahawked in full view of the fort. Clark was still wiping blood from his hands when he met Hamilton. The next morning, the British commander surrendered the fort. When his campaign was over, Clark had claimed for Virginia a territory more than half the size of the 13 colonies. But the land would seesaw between the British and rebels for the rest of the war. While the British were defending the Northwest, back east, they were launching the most notorious Indian raids of the war. In November, about 50 miles west of Albany, a party of Mohawk warriors and Tory rangers descended upon Cherry Valley, New York. The town was plundered and torched. 32 men, women, and children were slaughtered, many both scalped and dismembered. For both Congress and General Washington, the massacres were the last straw. In February of 1779, Washington ordered the total destruction and devastation of the Indian settlements and the capture of as many prisoners of every age and sex as possible. The Indian country was not merely to be overrun, he said, but destroyed. The commander-in-chief committed nearly 5,000 troops to the mission. The American army leveled more than 40 Indian towns and their fields and their orchards. 80% of the Seneca's tribal land was ravaged. Devastated, the Six Nations of the Iroquois were forced to beg food from the British that bitterly cold winter. Hundreds died of starvation and disease. Others froze to death. But the, la but the last thing that I want to talk about today is the war at sea. And this is a painting of 
the American fleet as it looked in 1776. Now, while Americans seem to be fighting on, on all fronts, in the north, the south, the west, the final front that we will talk about today is one is the war at sea, and this is one where the British definitely had the upper hand. There was very little that the Americans could do against this powerful British Navy. Remember, the British Navy was arguably the most powerful in the world. Um, but occasionally, the Americans would capture a British ship. Now remember, at the beginning of the war, all the way that we talked back back in chapter 6, section 1, about advantages and disadvantages, at the beginning of at the beginning of the war, there was no American Navy. Nothing. Uh, and even during the war, at most, there were about 60 American ships. Um, but there were a few bright spots. Uh, and the greatest American sea victory took place under the command of John Paul Jones. And our next video is going to talk about Jones and the many adv uh, adversities that he had to come in his own life to become this great American hero. But ultimately, the American Revolution was not one on the high seas, it was one in the South. And that is something we will talk about. <laughs> When the revolution began, Britain had 270 warships, America virtually none. In the autumn of 1776, a glimmer of maritime hope appeared in the form of a one-man submarine made of oak and covered with tar called the Turtle. Lighted within by the phosphorescent weed Foxfire, and propelled by a hand crank. The turtle's mission was to strew explosives into the hulls of British ships. But the screw was designed to penetrate wood, and British ships were lined with copper. Submarine warfare would have to wait another hundred years. During the entire war, fewer than 60 ships of the American Navy ever put to sea. One congressman described the Navy as a collection of tinkers, shoemakers, and horse jockeys. There was one brilliant exception, a Scottish-born captain whose name would become as famous in international waters as in America, John Paul Jones. He wasn't born John Paul Jones. He was born simply John Paul. And in the uh, 1760s, unfortunately, flogged to death a ship's carpenter who had in some way or shape been insubordinate. And he was accused of murder and uh, cleared ultimately of the charges. But in the 1770s, he once again uh, murdered a mutinous sailor and fearing that he would once again be charged with murder. He fled and took refuge in America, where he added the name Jones. When the revolution began, John Paul Jones was given a commission in the fledgling American Navy. In February 1779, he received a gift from the French, an ungainly old cargo ship, which he fitted with guns and christened Bonhomme Richard to honor poor Richard of Benjamin Franklin's famous almanac. In mid-August, Jones sailed from France in search of British prey. On the night of September 23rd, off the coast of England, Jones came abreast of the Serapis, a 50-gun warship. As the ships opened fire, there was a deafening roar. Two of Jones' largest cannons exploded, decimating his crew. Undaunted, Jones lashed his ship to the Serapis 
and continued the fight with light cannons and muskets. It became clearly apparent that the American ship was dominated by a will of the most unalterable resolution, and there could be no doubt that the intention of her commander was, if he could not conquer, to sink alongside. Captain Richard Pearson. They just blasted away at each other, and whether John Paul Jones ever said, I have just begun to fight or not, you know, he was definitely on the deck shouting at the British commander. They were shouting back and forth when they could be heard. And uh, the British commander probably decided, this guy's nuts. I'm never going to defeat him. It's, it's just, I mean, this is just ridiculous. I'm going to end up, we're all going to end up killing each other. John Paul Jones wouldn't stop. Finally, when the Serapis mainmast began to totter, Captain Pearson had had enough. The captain of the Serapis gave repeated orders for one of his crew to haul down the English flag, but no one would stir to do it. They were afraid of our riflemen. The captain, therefore, ascended the quarter deck and hauled down the very flag which he swore he would never strike to that infamous pirate, J.P. Jones. Lieutenant Nathaniel Fanning. The fight lasted more than three hours. Each side lost about 150 men, almost half of each crew. The victorious Bonhomme Richard sank two days later. And Jones sailed away on his new ship, the Serapis. Which brings us to our assignment for today. Now, there is no written assignment, but I want you to go back and review this section uh, section four in your textbook or on the online text in preparation for the upcoming chapter six test. Now there are no key terms for this section, but there will be questions about the main points. So the different fronts where people were fighting for liberty. Remember women that took play, took part in the war, African Americans, uh, the war in the in the West in the Indian territories, and finally who was John Paul Jones. You've seen his picture a lot in today's in today's lesson, like for instance right here, because he is the clue for the audio. The audio. Um, so, since you've seen John Paul Jones's face so much, it's a pretty good bet that you're going to see at least one question about him. So, review the key uh, ideas for this section, the different areas that people were fighting for liberty, and any successes that they might have gotten. All right. Well, that is it for today, so have a great rest of your day, and I will see you soon.